Welcome everybody to a special, you know, just call it an E9 for the hell of it, edition for the Masters, a little early uh, preview. Uh, we'll still do the normal Smash Factor probably Sunday afternoon or so, but I had the chance to bring on a special guest that has not been on in a while, but three years ago, almost to the day, we were in Augusta together. Um, Bucks, how are you doing today? Doing great, man. Uh, anytime we can talk Augusta, talk the Masters, it's a, it's a good day. So, yeah, everything's great, man. It is. Um, definitely unique in the sense of just had it in November. Um, a lot of storylines, too, coming into this one with, you know, Bryce and, you know, has he figured out Augusta? What, what will his mindset be? How will we react to that? Baby Watts for Rom, DJ kind of, quote, unquote, limping in with uh, not the best form. I don't think Brooks is going to play. We'll probably get more clarity on that. He's still in the field. He's not withdrawn, to my knowledge. He's in the pricing. Um, and then you got your usuals up there, Rory, Tony Finau, Shoffley. So a lot of unique ways to talk about, just specifically for DraftKings, betting as well. But um, when you look at the top of the board, the first, you know, my rankings are just finished. I'll post them out later. But my, my number one overall guy came out to be wrong. And in his biggest storyline with the baby swag deal, when it comes to DraftKings, do you play and just hope? I mean, he's been he's made it very clear that as soon as she goes into labor, he's out. He didn't care if it's Friday at Augusta or not. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess in his situation, being there before and this and that, like right. I, I get his sentiment, but it, it would be really hard to be in the lead or top three heading into Sunday and just dip. Yeah. <laughs> But with that being said, Rom is this was the the year that I thought it was his year for uh, the setup and how he's been playing and coming into it. If I were playing, uh, if I were Max entering the the Millie or something like that, I'd definitely be hammering Rom with quite a few lineups and hoping he plays. Um, just because you got to believe that his ownership is going to be down with the potential news of the baby coming in. Um, if I was just doing a three max or a single entry, I'm not going to play him, but he's been incredibly good for shit years, but this was like the year, like I said, that I, I think coming in, he's got to be, uh, top two favorites. So, yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, I think he will be with DJ. Um, I still think Bryson's going to get love. We have a, you know, resurging uh speed that we'll get to here in a little bit that, that also i think and, and is playing well right now at, at um valero again so you gotta think he'll have he's a fan favorite in general probably outside of tiger probably one of the biggest fan favorite when it comes just just public in general um so why don't i mean you're the og of the course preview why don't you break down the course a little bit and then tell me things that we may not want to pay attention to from november because it's going to be a completely completely different setup um but still some of the same guys still did well in November that have done well in April. But from your, your perspective, you know, break down the course and how you think it's going to set up as we get to next week. Yeah. I think this year, um, as we saw in November with DJ, just going on a tear 20 under, I think this year, what we're going to see is um, a little bit different from a scoring perspective. So the course is just under 7,500 yards obviously it's generous off the tee. Um, typically you're not too concerned about the guys that are spraying it just because the fairways are fairly wide and there's very little rough to be had out there. Um, that being said though, if you're in the first cut in the pine straw, it's pretty detrimental um, because this is a second shot golf course. The greens are just insane. And if you're not in the right parts of the greens, um, or if you miss the green on the, the wrong side, it's a really, really difficult to putt or up and down. And so while the fairways are fairly wide and you'll see a ton of fairways being hit this week, uh, there are a lot of guys that are going to be specifically going to certain parts of the fairway to attack some of these flags. And so when I think about uh, Augusta and how to play Augusta, and we've talked about this a ton over the years, I'm not too concerned about um, – hitting fairways or, or the, the driving categories off the tee. Uh, I do think distance is a, is a big factor here. The further up you can get, you can better control your spin uh, trajectory coming into the greens. 
Um, but overall, I mean, I think that's why like a guy like Spieth is historically played so well here. He's not the greatest driver of a golf ball, but over the years, his wedge game, his iron play has been great. Obviously he's been a solid putter, but it really brings into play those guys that are just elite with their iron play. Um, and so this year, I do think that the course is going to play a little bit different. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been con- some concern leading up to the actual event with rain, um, the dampness, and obviously Augusta has their sub air system and they can dry it out. But we saw the course last year play gettable. I mean, balls were not moving the way that they typically do. The first bounce wasn't uh, too extreme. And so we saw a lot of players attack the flags and just go after it and 20 under is just insane for Augusta. I mean, this year we don't have any real chance of heavy rains leading up to the event. I think overnight Wednesday to Thursday, there's probably a chance of a thunderstorm, but um, Monday all the way through Sunday, you're looking at very little, if any rain. And I think they're going to be able to get this course playing firm and fast. Um, And I think the greens, they're going to be able to, get to speeds that we haven't seen recently. And so I, I think that we'll see my personal opinion. I think we get to like the potential 12 under winner, which means the majority of the field is going to be mid single digits, even close to even par. Cause typically you have that one guy that's 12 under and the rest are maybe around there, but the majority of guys are going to be single digits under par in my opinion. So no, and I agree. Twelve under was actually the number I wrote down in, in my little preview that I, that I was working on. I, I think not only because Augusta never likes to get like dominated. They just you know even when Tiger did it, you know they revamped the course. And I think seeing DJ do what he did, that kind of I don't want to say made him mad because I think they understood with the time of the year they definitely knew that that was going to be a potential. I think it's going to be similar to 2019, except for your point of the rain part. As far as I think we'll have a bunch leaderboard. I think a lot of these guys are going to be right there on Sunday and anybody can take it on the back nine. I think that would be, that's how they want it in most cases. Someone can storm back, you know, like Jack did that type of deal. Um, That's how they want to set it up. And I do think it's going to play much tougher. And I, you know, I don't, I'm not going to exclude the 2020 results from the stuff because you still have the same guys that had done well. But a guy that, like a Sung Jay, you know, it was his first time playing it. He got second. He played well. Um, could a harder track be different for him, potentially? So I may look at some that has not played here more than once. That was their first time. Um, I think Scheffler was one that he top 20, you know, that had been there. But the guys like Rory, Cam Smith, obviously DJ, the guys that have played this course in many different setups, I don't really – won't factor too much Finau, you know ironically he's played it that was the worst he's played it in, in quite in yeah. a while um so you know that that won't affect me too much on as far as so we, we always hear um quote unquote soft pricing which i hate that word in general just because it, the pricing is what it is it is going to be uh, you know in my mind i did a quick deal i think i have 76 ish guys that i think i will legitimately take a look at um potentially and it'll probably get down to probably i mean six but there's i mean i think there's like 76 real guys here playing yeah. you're gonna have top 50 in ties um they got rid of the 10 cut rule last year from all accounts that was a permanent change it wasn't just because of the november deal so i mean you're looking at 65 plus percent of quote-unquote golfers that can contend so and when i say that because I'm, I'm a guy that doesn't like people calling people scrubs and all that i'm not talking about that i'm talking about like larry mize and yeah. You know, these guys are lifers and, they, and they're, they're not going to make the cut. But, you know, every once in a while, a Freddie Couples, a Bernard Longer, they'll make a cut. They'll, I mean, I think Longer finished top 30 um, sure. in November. And he's made the cut for the last five years. So <laughs> he's in my – that's a legitimate player. But Mize, uh, Immelman, those kind of guys, I, you know, I, Sammy Lyle, they're not, they're not going to compete. And then you got the amateurs, right, that, that I don't think will necessarily be in, in my pools either. But so, you know – call it 65 67 percent of this field could make the cut do you yeah. treat it like a limited like almost like a wgc that you, you know most people are going to make the cut and you change any any strategy or you treat it like a normal tournament where <laughs> you know i'm still got to try to get my guys through the cut where 
you know, I, I kind of I kind of hybrid the way I think about it. But what is your thoughts when you see so much of this field is going to make the cut? You still may have a chalky guy miss it. We've seen it with Paul Casey a few years oh, yeah. back. So uh, Sergio, the year we were there, you know, we, we saw the wrist, the stuff <laughs> on his wrist, and we, and we told everybody to get off of him. Um, yeah. I don't think we could have predicted the whatever he got on that hole, 13 or 14. But how do you attack when you have a little bit more comfort level in six of sixes getting through? Yeah, I think I think there's uh, one. I think it depends on the the contest you're playing and the number of lineups you're playing. But in general, um, playing the Masters with such a higher percentage making the cut, um, it it makes playing the stars and scrubs type uh, scenario way more in play than most events. Not only that, but when you look at let's just say top twenty is going to be five, six under having a top 20 at that number brings a whole hell of a lot of players back into play um, to make that happen. If if you were going to tell me that being in top 20, you had to get to 11, 12 under um, there's a lot of guys that I would eliminate from making that happen just because let's just say Bernard longer, you get, you got to get Bernard longer to 12, 13, 14, 15 under, um, with his length, it's a, t- a tall ask. But if you tell me that Ber- all Bernard has to do is shoot five under, that's way more in play in my mind. And so I think that brings a lot of other players uh, into play, which makes playing the, the stars and scrubs or the, the low price, high price guys uh, a much more valid um, strategy. That being said, though, like I said, the, the single entry, the three entry, that kind of thing. I play the guys you want to play, <laughs> play, play what makes the most amount of sense. I mean, every major has soft pricing, um, but we're, we're seeing it here as well. I mean, you have guys like Zalatoris that are what 7,300 or something like that. You have like day that's 7,500. You have Stuart sink, which is at 6,100 in my opinion, uh, a great play. I mean, again, m- m- majority of guys are going to make the cut. Sinks added a ton of yardage off the tee. He's been playing decent, and so there's just a lot of different scenarios to to go into this year. And then, like you said, there's a ton of storylines and how people are going to navigate it and build their lineups is going to be a different strategy this year. I mean, you got Rom with the baby stuff, DJ coming in. Rory has been playing great. Brooks is potentially out. Who knows? Finau hasn't been playing great, but he plays great here. Spieth back potentially. I mean, there's just so many different stories in play and so many different routes you can take. Um, I foresee ownership being spread out pretty, pretty wide. Yeah. That, that, you know, and to your point, I pulled up the 19 leaderboard and, and five under got you T, T21. So yeah. exactly what you're saying, a five under getting guy has a great point as far as who can get to that number is a lot more achievable than if, if 11 under is your T20 number, not five under. So, you know, I think that's a great point. I, I do think, I mean, so you got guys like Molinari, um, 7K, showing some life, showing some form, has obviously held the lead here um, in 2019. Certainly could be in play. A Paul Casey probably going to be one of, if not the highest owned, once again here um, at, at a very cheap 70, what is it, 76, 7,700 uh, yeah. dollars. Neiman, this is the first time that, you know, my man crush on him started was seeing him as an amateur <laughs> here yeah. in 2018. Had to miss um, in November because of COVID. So his first professional start here, but he has seen, of course, he's, you know, obviously played it, you know, once or, you know, that, that week. You know, Garcia is going to be helping him around and probably already had when we saw him that day, he was with Garcia. So, you know, yeah. Garcia kind of has him under his wings and certainly will, will help him around the course a little bit. Um, I can't imagine they're probably going to play practice rounds together. So I'm going to do the traditional smash on Sunday, maybe maybe Saturday. So, you know, the, the normal way I did. Um, so everybody listening out there, don't freak out because I'm not going through every single person. But up at the top, you know, 9K and above type of deal who's two or three guys that stick out to you? And then who's one that, that you think I may have to pass on because either ownership or you don't like what the game is. Um, and, and we'll put Brooks aside and just say, we don't know. Obviously if he's here, that's a different story, but let's assume he's not going to play, you know, nine can above who who's catching your eye right out the gate. 
Yeah, hold on. I'm pulling up DraftKings, but I can tell you off just up front, I'm going to be a huge fan of DJ this week. Like I said, I typically don't like playing the number one price guy, the highest price guy, um, just because it limits what you can do. And there's so much talent in the 8K and 7K range, even low nines. But again, this week, you can go a little heavier stars and scrubs and, and get away with it. And so um, I think when you consider John Rahm potentially dipping out, um, you consider Rory's not been playing great. Brooks is whatever. Um, DeChambeau, I think, sure he could go off right um but if he if there's one thing that he struggled with recently it's his wedge game and that cannot happen here right um and for me if i'm gonna spend 10 8 or 11 5 i'm gonna go with dj um every time and so i love dj this week um justin thomas is obviously in play he loves this course he's just an elite player in general and then the one guy in the upper nines that i love this week is cantley Yep. Very similar. I'm, I'm obviously no secret with DJ with me, but uh, <laughs> although, although he's, you know, he was the highest own in November. Um, I don't expect that this week because he's not coming in just on fire. Um, but his last four years here is a fourth, a 10th, a second, a first, <laughs> like, like it, yeah. you know, a 10th was his word and the year he missed, you know, when he fell down the stairs or whatever, um was the odds on like everybody thought he was just gonna you know I mean, he came in with like three straight wins or something coming into that year so I, i'm gonna be feel safe that he you know he probably would have five straight top tens or better here had he not missed that year um bryson to me do, do you think and you're much obviously a lot better golfer than i am is there validity to the green books and stuff that the masters doesn't allow and how much that may affect him here at all because i mean Tita Green, he's done well here, like like you said, it, it, wedge game and then putting. He seems to struggle at times. Um, when I looked at Tita Green over the last five years, he actually, I think he was number one here, but yeah. never can get it all together. And then because he seems to rely so much on the data and especially with those putting greens, and I don't know those as well as maybe you were, you know, a normal tournament allowing him versus the Masters. How much does that affect him? I, I mean, I, I don't think it affects him that much. I, I'd say that understanding who Bryson is, knowing that he's not going to have that those books available to him or that book available to him, he's probably memorized it somehow <laughs> yeah. and is getting to know every potential pin, yep. where he's going to leave it and what it's going to do. Um, so I, don't, I, I really don't think it's going to affect him that much. It, Bryson's just... I can't wait to watch him um, because he's one of those guys that if he catches this week where his wedge game is on, that he could just dominate the field. I mean, he's driving the ball really well. Um, but if he gets those wedges hot, I mean, it could be one of those DJ wins where he's just lapping the field in, in a bunch of different categories. Um, that being said, I mean, Again, it's, it's a pricing thing for me. I love DJ. I love JT. I love Cantlay. And so there's just certain guys I got to just stay away from because I'm not building 150 lineups. And so um, I'm going to avoid Bryson this week, but I, I don't think the book thing really affects his upside or potential. I mean, the dude's elite. I think um, pulling from some of that DJ ownership, I, I do think Shoffley, who's, who's done well here, and, and JT, who's coming in, probably with the best form, um, but never, I mean, he did finish fourth last year, which is, it seems like a quiet four just because of how bad DJ dominated before that, you know, he's had a 12th, a 17th, a 22nd, a 39th. So every year he's literally gotten better. I could see JT breaking through for sure. Um, and I think he'll up here, I think he'll probably be the, the highest own unless people just don't care about if there was no baby worry, I think Rom would be, I think people just love Rom and for good reason. I mean, he's got a fourth and ninth and a seventh here. Uh, the last three years he's been playing great coming in um i, I like you won't have rom unless I, I i mean i'll max a couple things and i'll, I'll certainly have some ownership there people are going to just be worrisome i feel like we'll know wednesday that he's obviously going to get asked that a ton i feel like we'll have a pretty good idea of his comfort level with how close she is um it's a baby going in i mean we you never know it's her first one 
sometimes that takes longer. Um, but I, yeah. I think like, and I think like you, like he'll, once he gets starting going, you would think it would take a lot. Like she would have to be like going. Now he said it over and over. So it'll be, an, it's going to be an interesting topic going into Wednesday night builds on, you know, where's Rom saying, <laughs> do we have any baby watch type yeah. stuff? Um, cause once it locks, then you're just screwed. It's either, you know, there's no change in it. Um, definitely be worse. So because of that, I think he'll be a low owned option. You can go to and just pray she holds off. Uh, and then I think, I think Rory is going to kind of go a little bit overlooked. Um, not, not driving the ball even remotely to his standard, still playing. Okay. Um, but missed the cut at TPC. You know he's going to break through here sometime. You got to feel he's going to get that green jacket. I don't think he's coming in the right mindset or or mentality. And I think Shoffley will be a guy people will say I'll just I'll just save two hundred bucks and go down if I'm making that choice, or I'll spend four hundred and go up to JT, who's coming in much better form. So in that middle range, so we're talking seven K, eight K. You know our core builders. You know you're going to, have to make your decisions up top. I agree with you on Cantley. I, I love Cantley. I like him coming in this week. Um, this is kind of where it gets you make some tough decisions um, in the seven and eight K range, and a, a lot of it for me always tends to go. I go with ownership. Like I'm going to take my leverages where I can in the in the seven eight thousand dollar range. Who's sticking out to you um, as, as hot plays coming in, in in these ranges? Yeah, for me, I mean, looking at, I mean, there's so many freaking guys in this range that are valid and coming in hot, that kind of thing. Um, I think. In the upper 8K range, mid 8K range, Sung JM is one of my favorites just because of how elite he is with his iron play. And if he can put himself in the right positions and just do what he does, I think he gives himself probably more opportunities than just about anybody. And it just comes down to whether they fall. And so that, that's been a struggle, obviously. And so, but from a uh, an Augusta standpoint, you try to do everything you can to eliminate the big number and miss the ball in the right places. And he's so elite with his iron play that I love him. Um, other guys that I think I'm looking at it this week, just because of pricing and upside, you got like Jason day is 7,500. Salatoris at 7,300 is insane to me um, for as well as he's been playing and how well he hits his irons. Neiman obviously is another guy that when I was initially thinking about the event, I was expecting kind of like the 83, 84, 8,500 range and he's 7,400. Um, but that whole range there, I mean, you have Zalatoris, Answer, Neiman, Usti, Jason Day, and Adam Scott, all 73 to 7,600 bucks. And it's just, I think that ownership is going to be spread around, but like I said, Neiman Day, Zalatoris, M, those are kind of like those mid range guys that I'm targeting as a three to five max player. Um, who are you liking in that range? Yeah, I think, and I talked about this in November a lot um, and I've already made notes of it, you know, for, for our community stuff is that I think too many people in this event, spe you know, specifically spend too much time worrying about ownership because it does generally seem to get spread out because there are a lot of great options if, if you want to call it soft pricing or whatever. Now, there are key points that you got to go, okay, maybe a Paul Casey winds up being 27% owned. Like there are going to be those rare ones that you may want to pivot off of and fade, but I think by and large, the majority of each pricing group, which I look at about every four to 600 bucks, are going to, it's going to be pretty spread out. There's going to be valid options for any of them. Um, I obviously love Neiman. I hope he doesn't get too – and Zal Torres. I've been on the Zal Torres train. I don't think Zal Torres will get it because he's a debutante, but I think what I try to tell people is, like, he's 7300 bucks. You don't have to go out there and win it. He just make the cut, top 20 upside at that price, and he certainly has it. We know his putter can struggle at times, but ball striking, he's going to be one of the top five in the field. Um, I really like Hoblin. I, I like where his game – I like his mentality. I don't think he gets – Iron play. Yeah. You know, I don't think he gets too serious about himself. I don't know if that's, you know, and I think here that can, that can matter because he can be relaxed. He's a guy that if he's in contention on Sunday, like I think he can relax and do all right. He played here in 2019. Um, first time out, got a 32nd. So that that's positive for me. It's, he's not a debutante. He's one of the guys, him and Berger, I think were the two guys that kind of got X'd out of the, with the way that they cut off the masters last year and they didn't let anybody in. Um, so him, they both had a miss in, in November, but 
I, I like that he's at least played here. I don't, you know, I don't think he'll be just overly, you know, talked about. But you know, Scheffler's a guy. I don't. We'll see how he does um, today. But I thought he would struggle after the seven rounds and grinding that match play last week, and he comes out and shoots a four under yesterday. I like his game a lot. Um, coming in with that good form. I know Kenny always has a great stat, so I can't wait to listen to him on where, you know, they got to be – all the winners have been in the top 30 or something in prior events or something like that. But that kind of stuff somewhat matters to me. But, I, you know, at the end of the day, these guys in this price range, I'm not really looking necessarily for the win, but I want the upside. So, like, Adam Scott, I think the way he plays here, he's a guy that I'll have my eye on. Yeah. And I, I, I think Molinari, I mean, he's shown that life that – and he's got some comfort here. Now, I guess he could – we can say this is where his the downturn started after he kind of lost the, the tournament there to Tiger on, on that Sunday. But seems comfortable. He seems like his home life is a lot better, more stable. And he's even talked about that a little bit, that at 7,000, I mean, he's a guy I look at. And then the last one for me, and then we'll talk about some cheap guys and, and call it a day. But I want to see how Matsu does. Um, you know, he got an early double yeah. this morning. But if he battles back and has a top five or potentially contends at, at Valero, and the ball striking's back. Um, he always plays this, this. I was just looking at his. I think his worst in the last five years. He's got a seventh, an eleventh, a nineteenth, a thirteenth, and a thirty-second. So five straight make cuts, eighty-three hundred. Um, I, I like Matsu, and especially if I can get him, people still have a negative connotation with him. Like and he, he's not been playing great at all. So showing some life at Valero, he's a guy I'll keep an eye on. Uh, as a potential four play for me as well. And I, I will max some stuff. I don't necessarily know what I'm going to play, but I, I will be looking at, I mean, I'm thinking about doing the 444 or whatever that is. Um, so I, I will be concentrating on the one and three max like you talk about as well. But um, when you, when you're building your three to five max, will you come down to the six K range? Are there guys you're comfortable with, or will you try to be a little bit more balanced or hybrid balanced? <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely going to come down to the 6K in at least one of those lineups because um, I do love DJ this week. I do love JT and Cantlay, and so I want to get pieces of them. Um, but when I look at the 7K range, it's stacked, so I'll spend a majority of my time there. Um, but in the 6K range, there are a couple guys that um, I really like. Carlos Ortiz is one that I, I love in this range. He's a guy that I've been playing recently anyways, but – Outside of his last event, he's been playing really solid. Um, Robbie McIntyre is another one I like for this golf course. Um, lefty, been playing well, likes to work the ball both ways, but is comfortable working it right to left. And then the one guy that I, I thought was mispriced um, based on the way he's been playing, that kind of thing is Stuart Sink. I mean, it's 6,100 yard or 6,100 bucks. He's picked up a ton of distance in the last year been playing decent and so i mean for when you got them surrounded by mike weir jim herman freddie couples longer um i think stewart sink is not like one <laughs> is like the odd man out there so i do like stewart sink i'll play him in probably one lineup just to get some peace uh there and it lets me build up top so um going back to what you were mentioning about some of the stats i, th I think um and kenny's gonna clear it up but it's something like the the winner or everybody in the top five the last like five years something has has come into event come into the event with a top 30 the current year and a top 30 at Augusta at some point in their career as well and then the the one stat that I always and I know we talked about how important ball striking here is or strokes gained approach but I think in the last six years here something like that there's only there's only been one person to come into the top 30 who lost uh, strokes in the strokes gained approach category oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or the strokes gained uh, uh, around the green category. And so those are two really, really important stats. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, and I'll be spreading sprinkles around this area when I'm maxing, but you know, I, there are some guys I definitely will take a look at as, as potential for a three max lineup or five, whatever. Uh, Connors is one whose ball striking is great and his around the green and stuff is improved mightily. New putting um, grip has gotten him playing better. Uh, coming in with great form. So he's got a seventh and a third. He finished 10th there. So meeting those criteria we just talked about. Um, Kokrak's a guy I'll, I'll sprinkle. I don't think many will go to him at 6,900 because there's other options. 
again, coming in with a ninth and an eighth. I like that he at least played this in 2020. You know, yeah. he hasn't seen it in this form, but cheap guy. Siwoo is a guy that I was surprised at how well he's played here. Um, but he missed the cut his first time. And he's got a 24th, a 21st, and a 34th. So, you know, inside the top 30, he finished ninth at the players. Um, you know, he's a guy that cheap, 6,700. You know, I, I like his game. And, you know, I think he could – I mean, he's obviously done well here before, so he was one. And then I had two more. Um, where is – you mentioned one that I – that I 100% sinks one that I think – oh, C.T. Pan is a guy that – well, he basically won me the 50000 on Sunday in November um, in the showdown lineup. He finished with three straight birdies uh, – or not, I think he birdied – 15, 16, 17, something like that. Got a backdoor seventh. Um, that was his first time out here. He got a third at Honda. So, you know, two back in the top 30, 6,400 bucks. He's a guy that won't pop in any kind of models, I don't think, but he's a guy that I, I don't mind going to, especially, you know, coming in with a little bit of confidence like he has. Um, and I agree with your sync call there. Um, in general, when you, you know, when you lock into your guys, or your core, um, right there at the end, what do you, do you let the week play out or like, are you like, I know I'm playing now and I just got to figure out who I'm going to put the pieces in. Like, how do you get to your strategy? Especially this is a rare situation where we get the pricing so early. There's a lot of overthink, a lot of, you know, paralysis by analysis type of situation. How do you, you know, we'll get out, we'll get out of here after this. I know you got stuff to do. How do you tell the community to, to trust their process and get to the right point and not rush you know, we still got a week, uh, you know, a little, little less than a week till we get to start this yeah. thing. But people are going to be talking about it every day, all day for the next six days. For sure. So for me, I start with three lineups. And, and when we were doing the pods together back in the day, I basically built every single one of my lineups on Monday before the pod. And it was a very rare occasion I ever switched it up. Um, and that worked for me because I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to stress about it, play my guys, trust my gut, that kind of thing. Um, uh, over the last couple of years, I've, I've largely kept the same mindset. So like right now, I'll probably build three lineups today, tomorrow, um, before a lot of the major content gets out. That way I can trust my process and how I think about it and it may be different than somebody else and how they think about it, but at least I'll have those three core lineups done. And then what I've been doing is there's some of these five max entry events over the week, as I hear chatter about certain people and, and, and a lot of, there's a lot of really good guys in the industry. When I listen to your stuff, Gup and Kenny, there's typically like one or two guys that I'm like, Oh man, I really didn't even consider him, mm -hmm. but I like it. And so, I'll build my final two lineups probably Wednesday before the event um, and lock those in too. So I got a sprinkle of just trusting myself and my process. And then I'm going to keep that same core, but sprinkling guys that the people I trust are, are, are on and playing. And so that's my process. That's how I go about it. And for me, it works. And I would say for my, uh, my mental <laughs> capacity at works. So I'm not stressing about it leading up to Wednesday. Um, especially this week, what I want to do is enjoy the week. Right. Like I don't want to be stressed about a Wednesday and then double get to Thursday morning and somebody does something. I'm like, man, I had him in my lineup. I switched off of him and I'm pissed off. Number one goal for me for master's week is to enjoy myself and watch good golf and hope it comes down to, uh, a back nine Sunday kind of duel between two or three, four or five guys and watch it play out. I don't be, I don't want to be worrying about my lineups and what I did and what I didn't do. And I should have done this kind of thing. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for the most part, I'm in that same deal. I have a few key spots where I'm like, all right, I'm basically bucketing my players, especially for the masters. Cause there's not as big of a, you know, you're cutting 60 guys out from the start that I'm getting to yeah. that next to last pool type of deal. More it's like, have these groups, these groups, and these groups, and you know, I start building that core, and I and then I go from there. Obviously, the industry talk and all that, I definitely want to listen to as well. I'll have plenty of coverage. Um, all what we, you know, Kenny, will be doing E nine and stuff like that. I'll have the full Smash Factor after I deep dive a little bit um, out Sunday. 
obviously next week will be loaded um, with all kinds of content all over the place. So it's good. It, it, I agree with you. It's a great point. Like you don't want to stress so much about this week because it's one of the best weeks, if not the best week um, golf wise of the year. So to enjoy that and, and then let it play out. It is what it is. You still got showdowns. Showdowns are bigger than they've ever been. So even if you go out the way, you can, you know, you still have a great weekend and and only worry about one day. Um, and like you said, don't overthink it. Like that's my biggest deal this week. You know, it, ownership's not going to be that big of a difference between that guy and this guy. Like go with the guy that you're comfortable. You don't want to be sitting there Sunday and be like, I love JT all week and I got off of him for 2%. I mean, that, especially when you're talking that three to five max type of stuff. I think that's important. I appreciate you coming on. Um, it's going to be an awesome week. You know, maybe we'll sneak in an E9, get a, maybe you, me, Kenny, um, see what your schedule's like. I know you're going to be busy yeah. next few days, but I appreciate it. And I will have Smash Out smash out by Sunday for you guys. Um, and then loaded next week, all with E9 on Wednesday. So enjoy the weekend, enjoy the process, and have a good day.